of the 10 causes of child death that are reducing the fastest, there are nine infections. And the infection that is uh, reduced the fastest is HIV AIDS, which is the most recent uh, new infection that uh, has been added as a cause of child death. And we will discuss how that came about, um, how the AIDS movement uh, really uh, brought this uh, radical change and one of the great success stories in uh, global and public health of our times. And it's very well de described in this uh, volume by UNAIDS, uh, where the lessons from the MDGs and the AIDS movement uh, are being discussed in detail. And this is actually very useful also when we talk about reducing child deaths. So I'm Peter Piot, and I am the director of the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, and I was the founding executive director of uh, UNAIDS. Child deaths from AIDS are falling by close to 7% per year. They've actually halved over the last uh, 15 years. And uh, most of these reductions are happening in just one country, and that's South Africa. Also because that's the country with the largest number of people living with HIV, a majority being women. Now, how did that come about? And there are three strategies to reduce uh, child deaths from AIDS. First of all, it's preventing mother-to-child transmission. And here we have a remarkable success story with now about two-thirds of all pregnant women having access to the necessary services to prevent their babies from becoming infected with HIV. That didn't come easy. The uh, intervention is straightforward. It's making sure that women know that they're living with HIV. Um, that has to happen um, in health services uh, during uh, antenatal clinic visits. It's making sure that they have access to uh, antiretroviral drugs, to prophylaxis, and that there is follow-up also with the baby. Uh, that took uh, quite a long time um, and sometimes required court action, like in South Africa. But we are here now, and uh, uh, that has, uh, coverage has resulted in a major reduction in uh, babies being born with HIV infection. So that's the first strategy. The second strategy is for those babies and children who uh, unfortunately, we were born with HIV where prevention failed or where their mothers did not have access to testing or to the necessary treatment. Um, these children need treatment, antiretroviral therapy. Here we're doing less well. Only one third of children in need uh, have access to antiretroviral therapy, which is like only half of what adults are getting. So we have a problem here. And it's a combination of issues. One diagnosis of uh, HIV infection in children is far more difficult than in adults, and often a doctor or a pediatrician would not even think of it, that this child could have HIV infection. And it's usually identified through actually a diagnosis of HIV in the mother. Secondly, the drugs are not that great. Um, pediatric formulations uh, don't exist for every single antiretroviral they're hard to administer, and very often they're far more expensive than the adult formulations, even if you need to give a much uh, a lower dose. That is all improving, but we still have a long way to go here. And then the third strategy is preventing adolescents and young people, particularly uh, young women, from becoming infected with HIV. And here I would say we see a massive failure of prevention. There are up to 800,000 adolescents and young adults under 24 who become infected with HIV every single year. And that's particularly the case for young women, for girls, and in South Africa, where again, we see the largest number of adolescents and young women becoming infected with HIV. The reasons for that are complex. Complex because they are rooted in gender norms, in societal norms, uh, from violence to the role of women. Uh, many of these girls are infected not by boys of their age, but by older men. And that has to do with poverty, with how, you know, with masculinity, with how we 
uh, look at the position of, of girls and women and, uh, in society and about uh, sexuality. And uh, the biggest problem is that there is massive denial about this. Massive denial that uh, young people have sex. Massive denial that it's only through intervening on some of the really fundamental and long-standing behaviors, particularly of men, that we can change this. And massive denial of providing young people with the necessary tools, from condoms to sex education, um, and I would say in uh, very high incidence uh, populations, such as in southern Africa, with uh, pre-exposure prophylaxis uh, with antiretrovirals. So here we definitely have to do better. And if we ever want to end the epidemic, we, the key for me is in southern Africa, uh, stopping HIV transmission in young women and in uh, young men and boys. Therefore, we need to act in multiple ways because this is an issue about society, societal norms, stigma, discrimination, um, about service delivery, about the availability of, uh, of new tools, of innovation. And what can we learn from the AIDS movement? What can the child health movement learn from the AIDS movement? And vice versa, I should say. It's only when the stars are aligned that we can move mountains, because that's what we need to do. Let me mention a few points that I think have been absolutely instrumental in the achievements of the AIDS movement. First of all, innovation and science. That brought us the drugs that are saving millions of lives now, and we have now 15 million people in low- and middle-income countries on antiretroviral therapy, coming from a couple of hundred thousands around 2000. And when everybody said this is not possible. So the second point I would say was that this leadership and being very ambitious. If you're not ambitious, you can never reach your goals. If you don't have that kind of ambition, one, you will set your goals too low, you'll be content with half-hearted solutions, and you will never end uh, this big problem of child mortality. But that requires leadership. A third issue is that we also need innovation in delivery. It's not just, you know, better health systems, because that's going to take quite a while. And it was one of the big arguments that was used by health systems experts that antiretroviral therapy is not possible in low- and middle-income countries because it's going to take a long time to fix these health systems. Now we have, you know, innovation in delivery, where you have, um, you know, so-called task shifting. People who are not um, doctors or nurses, they can be trained to do some specific aspects of providing treatment, providing prevention, and above all, it's involving the people themselves people living with HIV, activists, communities, and we need to do that also when it comes to uh, reducing uh, child mortality. And then, of course, after the innovation, the science, the delivery systems, and the leadership, there's always a need for money. Without money, even if you have the best strategy, we're not going to uh, make it. And for AIDS, we've established dedicated financing mechanisms for providing uh, not only treatment, but also prevention. The Global Fund to fight AIDS, TB and malaria is not only about AIDS, so there is some collateral benefits, particularly for malaria, which is also such an important cause uh, of child mortality. So let's make sure that also for child health, all the stars are getting aligned and they're all in place.